Brian, and this is a live stream on April 22nd, 2020, and this is about the one month mark for our lockdown here in California, and I think most of the people in the world are being affected right now. And I'm here to talk about our tutorial that we've been working on. It's called the iTag Bottom Up Drop Shoulder. And I'll be here to answer any questions that you have. I need to open up the Ravelry page with the questions. Just give me a second. I got some new lighting, and so I've been messing around with that. And, okay. I see some questions. Let's see. I answered those. Okay. So let's see who's on here with us today. Okay. Um, Evelyn. Hello, Evelyn. Cherie. Hi. Dolise. Hello, Dolise. Um, Susan Day. Elizabeth Nielsen from Sweden. Hello, Elizabeth. Um, Fatima. Good day, Fatima. Nice to see you too. Nancy Porter. Eric Joseph from Belgium. Hello, Eric. Francoise from France. Hello. And Renee, a neighbor. She's in a neighboring town. Diane Eddy. Walter from Montana. Hello, Walter. Rona Shane. Uh, from Southern California, Rebecca Cinco, Nada Hammett from Oman, T. Habercorn from Illinois, Pat Valenzano uh, from Maryland. Oh, thanks. She says the lighting looks great. So I still have to mess around with them, the temperature and stuff. I actually literally just got them plugged in. It's two lights, one over there and one over there. So um, I also bought myself a green screen and um, so I can change the background around. And what ultimately what I want to be able to do is picture in picture. I want to have my camera up here above where you can see that will shoot my hands and then this on my face. So when we do these uh, lessons like this, what I can do is I can be talking to you, that, but then if I want to show you a specific technique, I can switch the camera down to my hands and show you a close-up of my hands. So it's all a learning uh, thing. I've been taking a class, online class, during this coronavirus um, imprison, imprisoning, and I'm trying to learn more and how to do better presentations. Um, you know, it's kind of like knitting, the difference between homemade and handmade. I do kind of homemade presentations, but I want to learn how to do handmade, much more sophisticated. But I want, don't want to get so sophisticated that um, I leave my personality out of it. So it's, it's kind of a give and a take thing. So let's see, Rebecca, uh, Frank from San Francisco. Hello, Frank. Aline Mazuka, Kurt. Hi, Kurt. Grammy Luli. Sigma Williams, Nancy DePathy, Lindy Bear, Sharon Stoffer, Kimmy Knott. All righty. So um, let me go over and go through some of the questions. And some of them might be repetitive because I don't remember where we left off. So much has happened. Um, but first, let me just tell you where how, how it's going here in Bakersfield. We're pretty good. I think we've had um, quite a few cases here, but not very many deaths. We've had like four deaths. Our county is pretty good size. Uh, our county is bigger than some states in the United States, but not population-wise. We probably have, you know, maybe uh, half a million people or so in the whole county, 500,000 people. Most of those in Bakersfield, in the town where I live, but our county is very big and spread out. But being stuck in the home is getting old. It's really getting old. I do go out in my yard, and thanks goodness I've got all those beautiful flowers and everything, and, 
And I do talk to my neighbor from across the street and stuff like that. But it's being isolated is, uh, uh, it's getting old. We Zoom. I Zoom with my friends. I hope you're Zooming with your friends too. It's so fun. And, uh, and also I have my daughter and her entire family staying in my house with me. Because as I told you before, some of you may or may not have heard me say this, but before all of this happened, my daughter uh, has been planning for a couple of years to do major remodeling on their house, which requires them to move out. They live across the street, sideways from me. And the agreement was they would all come over here and stay in our house, which we have plenty of room. But my husband and I were thinking, okay, that'd be a great time for us to go on vacation and we can go here and go there so that we're not all on top of each other. Well, they moved in, you know, in January because that's when the construction started and it was going to last till about um, July. And then, then this came up. And so we can't go anywhere. My husband and I can't go anywhere. And so we're all here in the house together, five dogs and six people. And then I don't know if you can see those boxes back there. See all those boxes in the other room? That's all stuff that's arrived that's got to go in my daughter's house, like her bathroom sinks and her kitchen sink and some of the faucets and all. It's kind of accumulating in her stove. All of that's in my living room, a big bunch of boxes for the construction purposes. So things are a bit different here, a bit different, not bad just different, which really puts me out of my element. I never thought I was a stick in the mud. I always thought I was very flexible. But you know, when all of that happens in your whole world, like everybody, I am not the only one. I'm just using myself as an example. It's um, unsettling. And so you don't feel, you don't feel like you're on vacation. <laughs> you know, you don't even feel like you're at home, really, because you're forced to be at home. So I haven't really done much knitting. I did bring my knitting to show you what I'm working on, but I haven't made much progress at all. So that's that. Now you've caught up on that. Let's go over to these questions. Um, this is from about a month ago. This is from Lindy Bear. And she says, question, and if I already told these questions and answered them and I'm repeating myself, just let me know. As I said, I really don't remember where we left off. I'm using a superwash wool for my sweater. It really requires a trip in the dryer. When blocking my pieces, should I place them in the dryer and remove them when damp rather than do the wet blocking you described in the tutorial? I treat um, superwash and non-superwash exactly the same. I don't put my knitting in the washer or the dryer, whether it's superwash or non-superwash. I always hand soak in the sink or in a glass bowl or something like that, a container that's the right size for the knitting project. And then I roll, squeeze out the excess water without wringing it. I roll it in towels to absorb as much water as possible. And, um, and then I lay it out on my blocking boards to dry. So it sounds like maybe you need to absorb more of the water in towels before you lay it out to dry. I just, I just don't feel comfortable having my knitting bouncing around in the dryer. To me, that I don't know. But if you've done that before and you've been successful with it, go for it. It's you know I I haven't ever tried that because I just didn't feel comfortable doing it. I don't know if any of you other people have done that. Maybe you could chime in and answer that. While I'm thinking about this, just totally off the top of my head, I was thinking it would be fun if we all did some Zooming. Um, just anybody who wants to participate, not as a tutorial, not to learn anything, just to visit. And I would probably set it up and post it in my Facebook group. Um, I did purchase a subscription to Zoom so that we could use it for our local people here so that we can go beyond those 14, uh, the 40 minutes. So... It would be quite fun. I don't know if that's of interest to any of you. You can let me know. But I would post it in the Knitting with Suzanne Bryan Facebook group, not necessarily on Ravelry, because I think more people are on that group on a, on a routine basis than they are in the Ravelry group. When I first started these two groups out, um, I didn't know which one would work, whether one would be better than the other. And so I did both of them because they're really two completely different types of groups. 
The one on Ravelry is more about the tutorials and stuff and specific questions and supporting each other. And the one over on Facebook is just kind of random stuff. But people do develop a community together. That's why I thought it would be fun to Zoom. And I think we can get yeah, 100, 200 people on at the same time. Um, and see, you know, how that works. Now, Kurt, Kurt has said he replied to my uh, question about putting things in the dryer, dryer. He says some of the possum blend yarns fluff up, fluff up nicely in the dryer, tumble dryer. So, Kurt, do you put them in when they're wet and let them dry, or you just put them in and fluff them up? That would be an interesting thing to know. So zooming sounds fun. I think that we will try that. Um, and it might, it'll be just hit and miss. I'm not, I, I until I figure it out, well, I don't know. We can talk about it when we get on there. When we get a bunch of people on there, we'll talk about it, see when is the best time, and maybe we can do something once or twice a week. That would be fun. Okay, so next question. That was a tangent, wasn't it? Lady Vivian, I have done a provisional cast on. I'm planning to do an I-cord bind off later as I am planning to use a different color of yarn but have not been able to decide which color yet. Could I do the I-cord bind off after I seamed the sweater? Is that a bad idea? That's an excellent idea. I think I remember answering this one, so I must have done this. Um, because after you seam the sweater and you do the I-cord bind off, it'll be continuous all the way around the edge of the sweater. There won't be any place where you had to join it in seaming. In fact, if I was going to do an eye cord around the bottom of my sweater, that's exactly what I would do. I would seam first if the sweater requires seaming. Okay. Let me see. It's saying that my internet connection is not fast enough, but it should be. Is anybody getting in glitches in this? Are you getting glitches? Let me know. Okay, um, my internet speed usually is really fast. I have like 300 megabits per second, and so I don't know, maybe my granddaughters are using uh, streaming or something. They might be using some of it. Okay, that's what happens when you have a bunch of people in the same house. Okay, this is Moonrocker. With regard to Suzanne's future interviewees, Oh, I remember. I would, she'd like to have Tech Knitter. I did contact Tech Knitter, and um, Tech Knitter wants to remain anonymous. And I suggested putting a bag over his or her head and being funny or knitting or something. Uh, but I think it's the voice thing. So I don't really know if Tech Knitter is a man or a woman. But uh, they replied and said they were thrilled that I invited them, but they would prefer to remain anonymous. So I have some other people in mind. In fact, this Saturday, coming up in just a couple of days, I'm going to be interviewing Lucy Neatby. And I'm very, very excited about that. Okay, Sherry Connick said, I froze twice. Dolly says there are glitches. Are there still glitches? Still get, I'm going to go get my granddaughters off their iPads, okay? Just a minute. Okay, they were both on their iPad, so we'll see uh, if that helps. Let me go, I'm going to just see what it says on the internet too, because I want to know what's going on and see what the speed is. I'm sorry, just bear with me, okay? Oh, my speed's really fast. So I don't know why. Right now I'm getting like 150 megabits per second. 
download. Let's see what my upload is. Upload 5560. Okay. Who knows? Who knows? Okay. Here we are. I'm back. Um, so Okay, let me know if you see more glitches, okay? Um, so the next question. Hello, thank you again for such lovely tutorials. This is a lingual lu lunatic. <laughs> Cute, I love it. <laughs> thank you for such lovely tutorials. I've been watching your st stranded color work tutorials because I'm currently making the Al Pacino by Maxim Sear. I've not quite understood when I should twist the two yarns one stitch before where it will be used as opposed to doing the wrap and turn with it. Is there a reason you have done the wrap and turn on the ends in some cases rather than doing the twist on the edging? Would the twist at the edge work for me since I'm not at the border? AKA there are quite a few stitches between the intarsia and the edge of the sweater. So this is about intarsia and stranded color work. Um, and it sounds like it's being worked flat because that's the only time you'd have to worry about twisting at the edges. I use whatever technique uh, it seems will work at the edge to keep the two yarns going to the edge of the design without affecting the front side of the work. So when you're, whether you're doing, and uh, I think it's stranded color work he's talking about, but if you go to, you know, and you have a border of a plain color on each edge, if that's the case, and you've got your color work in the middle, I make sure that both colors come to the edge of the color work. For example, you might have five stitches of blue and three stitches of white, and the blue is, is going to the edge. You want to bring the white over to the edge of the blue. The reason being is on the next row, the white's probably going to start somewhere else and you want the yarn to be coming from the right of the stitch so that the yarn's coming from the right direction to make the stitch. If the yarn has to pull from the left to make a new stitch at the beginning of a row, it's going to distort that first stitch. It'll make it look like a half stitch instead of a whole stitch. So I always make sure I get both colors going all the way to both edges, uh, excluding any um, edging that would be a, a color, but the edge of the stranded work. Does that make sense? Are you getting what I'm saying? So um, if you don't, and we're, you know, see how that goes. This is from IRID3. Could you show examples of the soft and stand-up collar, stand-up shawl collars? I think I know what you mean, but I'm not quite sure. Yes, this one's a soft one. Let me take it off. And I don't have any that are the straight ones because I don't like those, so I don't make them for myself. But the soft one has um, extra stitches added. Now this one's in brioche, but you can see where I increase, can you see those increases? So I increased, it looks like a 25% increase across there. There's an increase right there. There's an increase. There's an increase. So what that does, and I just did it across the back of the collar. Here's the back from, from here, from here to here. That's the back neck. Okay. Here's a sleeve and here's a sleeve. So I did not do it over the sleeves. I just do it across the back of the neck. I make those increases. Can you see them? And so what that does is it gives more stitches out here. So when the collar folds over, it has, it has a soft it doesn't pull up. If you didn't have those increases, when it turned over, it would it would be tight, crisp, like a turtleneck. You know how a turtleneck comes up and comes like this, straight back down on itself? That's what it would be like, only it would be a shawl collar in the front. I like it to flow out a bit, so I add more like a... Um, 
I can't think of the word, but a, it, a turtleneck, but that flows out like this. So that's this is what I want. I want it to flow out. So I have those increases right on the edge there where it would fold so that when it folds back, it can flare out on itself and not restrict the stretching. Okay. IRID3 has another question. And I want my shawl collar to be about 4.5 inches wide, and I want a 3-inch button band. My tentative strategy is to knit all the short row fill-ins during the first 1.5 inches of the collar, then do the increases on the first full row, and finish the last 3 inches of the collar at the same time as the button bands. That sounds fine. But what that means, as you can see here on mine, from the inside again, because that's where you can see the increases, you can see them out here too. This is the right side. You can see those increases. Um, actually, it's a 30% increase because I have three and then one. So, um, but never mind. My mind's going all over the place. I blame it on being institutionalized in my house. Um, so, I did mine about a third of the way up. And my shawl collar, the total width of it from the edge of the body of the sweater to the edge is six inches. And my button band down the front is three inches. So I made mine twice because I wanted it to fold back on itself completely. And it's going to fold it work. What you're going to do is work. It'll work. Um, you would have less fabric after it folded. You'd have less fabric here and more fabric here. I wanted mine like 50-50, but yours is going to be like this, which is fine. That's fine. It's personal preference, and, and many people may like that, the collar to actually go more over onto the fabric. That's fine. So this is T.T. Shar. Question, I want to embroider my cable. Should I do this before the sweaters seam together? That's a plus and minus question. You can go both ways. For example, on my sweater, I seamed, I embroidered it after I seamed it together. You could do it either way, but by embroidering it after I put it together, I could match the embroidery more. Like areas like this where I'm going across here, coming up to the edge. Um, I didn't really want to embroider anywhere that would um, affect the seam. You know, so I came up to it. And it's like weaving in ends. I only weave in my ends after I've seamed. I don't weave in any of the ends in my garment until after I've done the seaming. Because I will tell you, even if you're super careful You'll always end up, if you weave in your ends first before seaming, it seems like you always end up weaving them into some area that's going to affect a seam. And then it makes seaming difficult. Seaming is difficult enough as it is, but I love seaming. Once you get the hang of it and are very good at it, you will like it too if you don't already. Um, but anything that impedes the seam makes the seam look less lovely. So... It's the same way with the embroidery. I think that it depends on what where you are working on your sweater, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but probably doing the embroidery after seaming uh, may be more productive than doing it before seaming because you don't want to interfere. You don't want to get any excess yarn into the areas where you're going to be seaming because it will affect the seam. And even though uh, when, when you do seaming and it comes out nice like this, here's my shoulder. You can see that both the front and the back going into the shoulder and then the sleeve coming out of it. And what's cool, this is another reason why I like saddles. Let me unbutton my sweater. The reason I like to put saddles in this type of a garment is the front and the back do not have to match. This is the front of the garment over here. This is the back. And you can see that if I had not put a saddle in, the front and the back would not come together at the seam, would they? 
But by putting a saddle in there, it totally distances them and it doesn't matter. So I can make my front however I want. There's my front. There's the front with the saddle. Looks good. Here's the sleeve coming off way over here. Here's the back. Here's the sleeve. It looks good. But if I had tried to seam together that front with the back without the saddle, that would have looked unplanned, like nobody planned it in advance. Um, you can also see that I did my embroidery after I put my neck edging on because I brought the embroidery up through the edging of the neck. Okay, so that was that good. This is Jay Lausch. And <laughs> Joanne Young says, Suzanne, you are funny, but I empathize with you. <laughs> you do what you can, you know. This is uh, Jay Lau's question. Almost ready to start front of cardigan. I'm planning to put in a zipper. I want to knit both sides at the same time, so I'm planning to put in a steak. My question is how much seam allowance do I need for the zipper? Would appreciate any tips on zipper. Um, the seam allowance for the zipper depends on the weight of the yarn that you're using. If you're using fingering weight yarn, or if you're actually the seam allowance for the steak, if you're using fingering weight yarn, the steak can be narrower than it is if you're using bulky yarn. You want to have a couple of stitches on either side of where you're going to cut up the center of the steak. So your steak needs to be, you know, five or seven uh, stitches wide so that when you cut up the center, if you make it five, that'd leave two stitches on each side. In bulky yarn, I don't know if that'd really be enough. You might want to use a seven uh, stitch wide steak. So that when you cut up, you have three whole stitches on each side. When you cut up the center, you're ruining that center column of stitches, so it doesn't really count anymore. As far as the zipper is concerned, you need to have enough stitches, probably, as the width of the zipper fabric on each side, so that when you're putting the zipper in, actually less than the, the width of the so it hides under the edge of the zipper. And where's the one, my sample with the zipper in it? Let me show you that. I have that here. Let's see if I can find it easily. Cross your fingers. What color was it? This is one of my bags of swatches that I use for my videos. And I haven't done a video for a long time. I need to get back on that. I'm not finding it real quick. Oh, there it is. Just when I was going to give up. Okay, so on this one, here's my zipper. Let's see. There you can see it. And what I did on that is I did, um, I picked up stitches. You can see on the back of the work, I picked up stitches and knitted a band on either side. And the band is um, two rows of, one row of stockinette, two rows of reverse stockinette, a row of stockinette, and two rows of reverse stockinette. And this is actually the edge of the knitting. This is the bind off edge right here. So nothing is turned back underneath. That's the bind off edge. Can you see it? And then I sewed between in the ditch. You know how you sew in the ditch when you're doing a garment? I sewed in the ditch between the reversed stockinette. You can see my seaming stitches on my sewing machine right there. Can you see them? That little line? I seamed in the ditch. I use this technique to use the sewing machine to seam in this ditch. And you could put this in by hand too if you want, but um, I do it on the sewing machine. And I use that tape 
you can't see it on here it's it's made for quilting for piecing quilting it's a double sticky very very thin almost like um, um, interfacing that is dissolvable to put my zipper on the knitting to stick it on the knitting so that you're not you can make sure that this knitted fabric is not stretched out because you can see what's cool about this zipper is it matches the fabric exactly worst case is when you start sewing on your knitting and it starts stretching but the zipper does not stretch I think I made two of these because one of them I sewed down you can buy that uh, uh, ribbon to put on the back side let me see I know I have that one too I know I made one that I sewed it down by hand and put on the, the tape on the back side I keep saying that I'm going to organize this and put it in binders so I can find things, but that hasn't happened, and, and I doubt that it ever will happen. I don't see it off the top of my head, but um, it's in my video. It's in the video that I made on making a zipper, so you, you'll see it there. So that answers that question, okay? Here, this person, J. Louse, also asks, any reason to not do short row buildup on the back neck for the bottom-up saddle shoulder project? Yes, you don't need short rows on the back neck because what you have is the saddle. This is the back neck. There's the back neck. Then the saddle creates what you would use for short rows. So it allows the shoulders to come up and that's what you would use short rows for is to bring the shoulders up on either side of the neck the saddles replace that so I don't think you want to do short rows with a saddle if you weren't putting the saddle in and you were just seaming the shoulders yes you could use short rows one more question from Ravelry and then I'll look over now you guys you know you can ask me questions just be sure to put the word question in all caps this is Linda Bear when seaming the sides and the sleeves, is it better to seam the side from bottom to armhole and then do the sleeve from the cuff up to the armhole or just keep seaming from the armhole down to the cuff? I start at the armhole and go down. But it doesn't matter. It's personal preference. Um, you just want to make sure everything matches up when you get to the end of the seam, whichever way it is that you're going. You can use those little clippies or pins to you know put the fabric together and if you've you if you've counted your rows and your stitches when you're seaming and you know when you knitted it that you matched the sides with the same number of rows um, they should match up perfectly the sleeve automatically should match up because you're going to have the same number of rows on each side of the sleeve because you've knitted it back and forth like this right so both sides should have the exact same number of rows so when you go to seam that together it should match perfectly it's when you're matching the front of the sweater to the back down the side or up the side <coughs> that you want to make sure you have either have the same number of rows on each side or you know how many rows you have so you can compensate to match them up um, I do not use one long strand going from the bottom of the sweater to the armhole and then out to the cuff, or vice versa. The reason being is if you need to make some adjustment, like let's say you seam all the way down the side from the armpit down to the bottom of the sweater and it turns out you have some extra rows at the bottom, you only need to take out part of it. You don't need to take out the whole thing. So I like to have, and sometimes you can just adjust it like let's say you seam the right side of your sweater and the left side of your sweater and one's longer than the other because of how you pulled the seam up maybe you pulled the seam too tight on one side tighter than you did on the other side if you have an end of yarn at the armpit and an end of yarn at the bottom of the sweater that gives you room to adjust the length of the seam like this by either you know allowing the seaming yarn to go up into it uh, or you can pull it tighter to match the other side.
those are just little itty bitty things. So that's all of Ravelry. Let me just make refresh that page and make sure nobody else has added anything while we've been on here. That's the last question. Okay, let me come over here and see what you guys have, are up to now, okay? Go up to the top. Look for the questions. Fatima says, I like this. It makes me feel good. With this group, we must feel so close. I do not feel the lockdown. I spend the time possibly possible knitting. So good. Good. Zoom would be good. Okay, Kurt was replying to putting the pos, the yarn with the pos mint. They go in very nearly dry or dry spirits with spritz with water, like everything. Swatch first, exactly. Do try it on a swatch. Linda Bear says, Suzanne, I put my pieces in the dryer and tumbled them until they were slightly damp, then laid block and laid flat and blocked them. They turned out nicely. Another thing you could do, uh, rather than putting them in, the, I just don't get it with the tumbling in the dryer. It's too scary for me with my um, knitting, but you can certainly put something in your washer and run it through the spin cycle, and that will spin out a lot of extra water if you need to do that. Okay, has anybody got any more glitches? The glitches go away. Okay. Question. T. Habercorn. Suzanne, would you please discuss the difference in gauge some people have when working flat and in the round, such as in a cardigan body versus sleeves? Excellent, excellent question. Yes. Most knitters have a difference in gauge between their knits and their pearls. If you don't, you're very lucky. Um, and most, many people do not realize that they do have a difference between their knits and they per their pearls. They think all of their knitting stitches are the same size. The only way that you can tell this is by swatching. And what I would do is, um, there's several ways you can do it. One is to knit a piece flat, like back and forth. Uh, let's say you knit 20 stitches wide and then purl 20, knit 20, purl 20. So that's got an even number of knits and purls. Then cast on um, 40 stitches and knit in the round. Oh, there's cinnamons here. That's my, one of my daughter's dogs cast on 40 stitches and knit in the round so you'd be all knitting. Lay it down and it should be the same width as the knits in the purl, the knit flat, right? Or you could work a swatch in garter stitch where you knit every single row and mark it that you knitted it. Knit another swatch where you purl every, in garter stitch where you purl every single row, solid purling. Block both of them and measure their width. See if the width is the same. Most likely one will be different than the other. Now, for a long time, um, and still in most of the literature that you read, most people will say that if you're if there's going to be a difference between knits and pearls in your knitting, that it will be the pearls that are larger. Um, that's in most of the, li the literature, but that is not true. Um, my pearls were smaller. My knits were larger. And I've even sat in on classes where highly recognized instructors will tell you that it's always, they'll say it's always the pearls that are larger. It's not. So I did a test on this. You may have heard me tell this story before. In my guild, we had about 20 people there that day. This is many years ago. And um, I had everybody uh, bring, I brought the yarn and I had them bring size seven needles and I brought worsted weight yarn, two different colors. 
and um, I had them knit a swatch. I said, eh. it was all the same color. It was just white worsted weight yarn. I had them work a swatch in stockinette stitch. So at the end of a purl row, I had them mark the tops of those stitches with a black marking pen, and then I had them knit a row, purl row, knit a row. So then we cut the swatch up the sides, take it off the needles, cut it up the side so there's no edge stitches involved because sometimes edge stitches can be very distorted and affect the uh, length of yarn that you're using. So we just cut it straight up the sides, all the edge stitches off, found the strand that was marked with the black, and found the strand right below that, and compared the length of the two. About half the room, more than half the room, the one that was marked as pearls was longer than the strand that was knits. The remaining people, their pearls were smaller and their knits took up more yarn. So I divided them in half, we took pictures, and then I had them, they were holding up their strands like this. We actually laid them on a table and measured them. So then I said, okay, of all the people that have the enlarged knits, their knit uh, stitches took up more yarn, how many are continental knitters? All of them. All the people that had enlarged pearls, where their pearl stitches took more yarn than their knits. How many are throwers? All of them. So the thing is, a lot of the literature that people in the United States read and people in England read and the England-associated countries read is people who throw their yarn, throw their stitches. And so, of course, their pearls would be bigger because evidently when you throw your yarn, the, it causes the pearls to be bigger somehow. I'm a continental knitter. I had enlarged knits, and I kept reading and trying to figure out how to decrease the size of my knit stitches, and everything was talking about tightening up your pearls. I did not realize that my knits were the bigger. I didn't know they were the problem. I just knew I had a problem, an inconsistency between my rows, and I wasn't uh, knowledgeable enough to figure out whether it was the knit rows or the pearl rows. I, I wasn't at that stage in my knitting. I just could see that I had a problem. And so I kept studying and everybody says, tighten up your pearls, tighten up your pearls. And I tighten up my pearls and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And finally, I realized it was my knit stitches. And, and then I started thinking about and watching how I'm making and forming my knit stitches. And I worked on that, figured out what I was doing. And now all of my stitches are the same size. Solved that problem. But that took me about a year to figure that out quite some time ago. So if I hadn't have figured out my problem because my knits were bigger, if I knitted a sweater in pieces and then I knitted, or it was a cardigan, so it's knit back and forth, and I get to the sleeves and I'm going to knit them in the round, my sleeves would have, there would have been a line where I started my sleeve and it would have been bigger. The stitches would have all been bigger and it'd be very noticeable. If I were a thrower and the fact was that my pearls were larger than my knits, you would notice that the stitches in your sleeve were smaller. And it is obvious. It's easy to see uh, once you know to look for it. When you don't know to look for it, you don't notice it. But once you know, you'll start looking at people's sweaters and you will see that there is a difference between their knits and their pearls. So it might be that your knits are bigger, it might be that your knits are smaller, and you have to do your own research and figure that out. And even if you think all of your stitches are the same size, it's still worth doing the research and thinking about it because it might be, you might be surprised that your stitches aren't all the same size. That's a really, really good question. That was a long answer, huh? Okay. And Renee says, yes, seam with a separate piece of yarn. Ask me how I know. <laughs> yep, it just makes life better. <laughs> this is Eva. She says, hundreds of tips and tricks <laughs> learned again. Thank you, Suzanne. Well, I'm a commenter too, and I didn't realize that. Thank you. Question. Roxandra. I'm a continental. How did you get all the stitches the same size, please? Oh, okay. So let me tell you. 
you have to watch yourself knit and purl. You have to literally watch not the yarn going around the needle, but what are your hands doing? So what I was doing when my knits were bigger, let me get some. Here's a needle with some stitches on it. The yarn's broken off, but there's enough here I can work with. Okay, so continental, that means I'm holding the yarn in my left hand. And you're seeing the back side of this, but you'll, you'll get the idea. What I was doing that was creating my knits to be bigger. Let me get away from the edge. Okay, when you are a continental knitter, or a.k.a. picker, right? Picking. And why is it called picking? Because you pick the yarn off your finger. So this is the back side, but this is my finger here. This is the new stitch comes to this needle. These are the stitches I'm knitting into. I would put my needle in here and then I took this finger and I pushed the yarn all the way around the needle and then took it off. Well, I was inadvertently pushing extra yarn into, oh, there's Oscar. And that was one of my dogs pushing extra yarn into the stitch. So what you've got to do is you've got to go into the stitch. There's my needle and pick it off of your finger. You can't use that finger to push the, the yarn around. So I was going like this. I was using this finger. I don't have my yarn in here. Okay. I was using this finger, the one that's wiggling. I was using it to push the yarn around the needle. Do you see how I just did that? And it pushed extra yarn. I don't think I can do it this way. I can't do it that way. But I have a video on that. Um, I don't know what. It's getting even tension or something like that. See, and each person's going to be different. Whatever it is that you're doing is probably different than any other person. Another thing you can do is watch other people knit who that you know have even tension that are continental knitter. The problem is there's not very many continental knitters. Uh, we're, we're in the uh, minority. But I love continental knitters. So if you're a continental knitter, you're on my team. We're on the A team. Okay. Um, any other questions? We've been on here for almost 50 minutes. Just flew by. Oh my goodness. I thought it was going to be like 10 minutes long. If you have any other questions, let me know. Um, I'm probably going to start, it depends on how it's going with the coronavirus and all that, but the Zooming should be fun. I might start that um, maybe even today. I don't know. I think it'd be really fun over there on Facebook to see all your faces and see everybody in their natural environment. I think that'll be fun. That's a good idea. It won't uh, be in place of this because I can't really teach you things on Zoom knitting. It's just going to be talking, chit-chatting, knitting together. Get your, Bring your knitting, get a cup of tea or whatever, and we can sit and just be together. Um, so any other questions? If not, um, remember this Saturday, 2 o'clock Pacific time, will be Lucy Neatby, and you will not want to miss that. She is amazing 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 you know she does double knitting and she and i've already interviewed alistair posquin on double knitting and nathan taylor on double knitting and um so she has a different point of view than they do so it'll be really interesting to see what she has to say about double knitting so let's see patricia vella she says question are you still planning on doing a set in sleeve eye tech yes next winter you know we'd probably start in after november i'm going to be teaching at the knitting guild association is having a retreat in portland next november the big it's like in the first week of november after that i will start the uh, next uh, tutorial that'll be the last one um, but we'll do the set in sleeves so let's see um, oh, Kurt says, 
I would love to see interviews with Dee Gilpin and Lucy Haig if the time difference works. I'll, I'll contact them. I'll put them on my list and see how that works. Yeah, if it's in the middle of the night, it makes it hard for them. Um, okay, so I'm going to let you go. Um, I might just zip right over onto Facebook right now and see if we can do a Zoom just for a test to see how it works. So hang up here, uh, look over in Facebook in a few minutes, and we'll see how that goes. And I'll see you on Saturday and possibly next week. Love you all and happy knitting.